Hello, everyone. My name is Sujin Kang, and I'm the Senior Events Manager here with the CMX and Bevy team. And welcome to today's masterclass on mastering the community growth funnel with Amber Atherton and Derek Anderson. We're so excited for the session with you all, and thanks so much for joining us today. We have the next hour or so together where we'll hear from Amber and Derek. And we'll then close our time with a Q&A. So with that said, I am so happy to introduce today's guest, Amber Atherton. Hi, Amber. Hello. Very, very sunny for everyone in California. It's a very glowing uh, morning. I can't seem to angle my desk without glowing. So <laughs> also somewhere in the chat that someone is saying, I think Dana is saying hi from 14 degrees in Denver. So definitely, definitely different, different climates. But, <laughs> um, thanks so much, Amber, for joining us today. I am so excited to have you here. Um, just a really quick intro. Amber is the author of The Rise of Virtual Communities and congratulations on this book. Um, everyone, please be on the lookout. I'll be pinning the link to her new website shortly. So be on the lookout for that. But she's also an early stage venture capitalist at Patron XYZ. And we're so excited to hear from her. And I'm also excited to bring in Derek Anderson, who's also here, our very own CEO at Bevy and CMX. So he'll be leading the discussion today as we discuss the growth market, um, the growth community funnel. So Derek, I'll go ahead and pass it to you. Great. Thanks so much, Sujin. And uh, Amber, it's great to be with you. And Huge welcome to everyone uh, who's joining us. We have a great group and it's such a cool thing to be, this is, it's still amazing like to see, you know, people popping up from all around the world and participating in this together. I don't know, it just never gets old um, to be able to do something like this at, you know, nine, nine in the morning for us, different times for everyone else, but really uh, grateful everyone could join and uh, especially Amber, that you could be here. Um, love to just start uh, by having you, uh, if you don't mind, just share a bit about your journey of how you uh, came into the community industry and what's what sort of led you to this point of of uh, of you know you had a really amazing uh, career so far, but how, how'd you get into the community? Yeah, uh, thank you. And, and good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here with us. And thank you, uh, Derek, for this kind invitation. Um, so I think uh, when you're in community, you probably always just feel naturally drawn to connecting people and um, uh, you're like naturally curious about uh, people's interests. And um, that, that was certainly the case for me. I was born and grew up in Hong Kong and spent a lot of my childhood moving around to many different countries. And I sort of had to build this muscle of uh, making friends, figuring out, uh, you know, who people were and who I could get connected to. And I think that uh, muscle from childhood built through uh, to becoming a founder um, and uh, spending a lot of time uh, on the computer <laughs> and building little fun experiences online um, that uh, bring joy to people. And uh, yeah, so sort of that that background led me into the community space um, as a, as a teenager on a lot of online forums and bulletin board systems, etc. <laughs> awesome. Well, you it's interesting because uh, to you, I mean, you've um, you know you're you're a creator. You also um, you know work inside of big companies, and now now you're an investor. Um, yes. Uh, do you? I mean, do you? it's kind of a, a very, those are very different things. Have you, have you figured out, I mean, right now you're an investor, so uh, maybe a bias towards that being, being the best path, but um, what, what, uh, what sort of led you from sort of being a player into, you know, going in, onto the investing side of things and what, what have you learned there in, in, in your, your time spent investing in companies? Yeah. Um, well, uh, so yeah, I started out, uh, spent most of my career as, as a founder uh, in and around the community space, like the, the, the WordPress blogging scene, the early Tumblr scene, and I'm very excited to see Tumblr coming back through automatic. Um, uh, but yeah, I, uh, I 
went the founder route um, and then uh, my company was acquired by Discord and uh, I spent uh, two incredible years there uh, with an amazing team uh, leading community growth. Uh, so figuring out how can we bring new types of communities onto Discord, creators, brands. Um, and uh, fr from there, I started to get interested in angel investing in other founders who were building for really passionate communities. Uh, so I did a few personal angel investments. And through that, I got to meet some other people in the venture scene um, and met Brian and Jason from patron.xyz, uh, where I'm now a partner. Um, and they share a very uh, similar world outlook to me. They understand the importance that like community really is the product. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's been a very exciting uh, ride for the last sort of three, four weeks being part of their team and uh, investing in what we believe the future to be, which is that everything is becoming uh, a game. So any gaming founders out there uh, or orbiting gaming, uh, we'd love to chat. So there's, there's lots of terminologies thrown out in the industry uh, and you've put together this quadrant uh, and, and, and would love to sort of understand, um, you know, this, how, how you sort of look at this specifically. Um, you want community builders uh, to really understand that the community uh, differs from other groups of people who interact with the product and uh yeah, I wonder if you could just share more in depth about the sort of similarities and, and differences between evangelists and community members and some of these different groups um, and, and how, they're, how they're similar and how they're not similar. Yeah, I mean, I put this together because uh, I, I was getting a bit frustrated talking to folks, uh, uh, you know, whether they were, they were bigger companies or uh, f founders sort of it's considering that like just the, just their customers were a community when in fact they, they weren't, they were, they were just buying the product and they weren't forming, uh, you know, there was no sense of belonging. There's no utility. Customers weren't even talking to each other. So that that's not really a community. So I started thinking like yeah. how, how to make something very easy. Uh, obviously a lot of this Venn diagrams over, but um, just as a starting point for folks to understand, uh, who are new to the space and thinking about investing in uh, a community team and um, prioritizing this as a work stream. Um, I thought, let's just segment this out into a very easy to understand quadrant. So you have users and customers. So these are people that buy and use your product every day. They, they might not, um, you know, talk to other customers, but they certainly are uh, trans interacting with your brand or your company. Um, and then ideally, these users and customers become your evangelists. So they buy and use your product and they love it so much that they just tell everyone about it. Um, and my, my first startup, um, uh, well, Zyper, was, was really focused on that. We believed that wow, the people who are your evangelists are so important, yet so many big companies and brands just ignore those folks and look for influencers when really that grassroots evangelism and peer-to-peer -peer referral is the most effective form of advertising. So let's bring those people together into private communities. Um, so uh, figuring out how you transition users um, to evangelists is, a, is another point we can get onto. Um, but then obviously ambassadors play a role. So, um, you know, the, these people are uh, great to get involved in uh, promoting your product, um, typically incentivized by payments or rewards. I recommend that uh, folks have just a separate community for their ambassadors, whether it's nano um, influencers, bloggers, Twitter influencers. Um, we uh, did a lot of this at Zyper and at Discord. Um, you know, for example, with Sephora, we brought Sephora's top fans into a private space and they were being incentivized. And uh, it was a great uh, way to, to build a very, very specific niche community that had a ton of engagement. Um, and then lastly, you know, we get to this final community panel. Um, and the way I think about it is that these are not just your customers who are buying or interacting with your product. These people have found belonging and utility through your product. So mm -hmm. uh, I think about Rapper, um, the cycling 
brand, you know, you can uh, meet other people there, you're doing an activity together and, um, you know, you're enjoying spending time interacting with others who share an interest in cycling and all the topics around it. Um, so in that way, like your brand and company can be the vehicle for the community to get together. Um, so that's that's the uh, ethos of the quadrant is let's separate like the value chain um, and figure out, you know, how to, to build belonging um, for community members. There, there's probably a lot of overlap between users going into different quadrants and in different areas. How, how do you um, do you sort of ruthlessly segment people into these different groups uh, and build sort of programs around helping each individual group or do you let people kind of, uh, you know, kind of mesh in, in between groups or how, how do you, how do you look at that in terms of growing and cultivating these people, you sort of put them in, put them in the box or do you, do you let them yeah, I guess it's like more more of an art than a science. Um, so definitely being flexible to people, uh, like fluidly moving in and out of the boxes is a good way to to think about it. But um, I I think particularly if you're a startup founder, um, you know your goal is to create something that that people want. Um, and so my perception is that that's the most important. Like create creating a product that people want. Um, uh, first and foremost, uh, then it's figuring out, okay, have you developed that product with them? What do they really want? And then naturally they then feel like they are building the brand with you. They can become evangelists. Um, so yeah, I think devising specific, um, programs for each of these segments is, is important. Um, but starting with like the users and customers and evangelists, like, what are, um, yeah, who are those early people who are going to help define what the purpose of your product is uh, and help you grow it early on? Um, and in, in, in the, the article, when I initially like laid out this uh, strategy, um, just, just figuring out the first 10, the first 20, up to the first 50 people that are signed up to your newsletter or signed up to your product waitlist, and then bringing them into a private space where you can figure out what do they want um, and what would be valuable. It might be AMAs, it might be IRL meetups, it might be you know weekly game playing. Um, so there's a lot of like experimentation in the beginning um, before you get to sort of the, the fourth panel. Yeah, um, maybe maybe you could talk through, yeah, this, this concept around the community funnel um, and sort of helping yeah. to, to understand what makes uh, a community compelling to members. Um, you talk about creating an inviting space, ensuring there are sort of human elements uh, when inviting prospective members to conversation at the earliest stages. What, what are those key factors in moving someone from, from being an evangelist or a participant to someone who's, who's really an, an, an active contributor? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and Sujin, maybe, maybe, uh, we could show the, the diagram, um, just, just for folks. Um, uh, but yeah, I started thinking, um, I think a good point in the chat here, like the quadrant is about understanding the ecosystem of users, um, and designing value for each stage of the, uh, of the users like life cycle with you. Um, and then the community funnel is a much more like tactical way of how you're going to get people from the very top of the funnel down into becoming like advocates, not just for the product and the company, but for the community itself. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, and I think each stage here requires like thoughtful strategy. So one, get invited to discover the community. How do people learn about your community? Do you one, want to set like a very high bar of, uh, you know, gamifying it? So at Geneva, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with that community platform. Um, it's actually really hard to find some of the invites for Geneva groups. So that gamification in itself is, uh, helping you qualify users who you know that they're going to be interested in being an active member just by virtue of how difficult it is to even find the community. Um, and actually, if you look at Discord, most of the 
invites to communities are uh, private. It's very difficult to actually find Discord servers. Um, and I think that is, uh, a, a, you know, it's a feature, not a bug. We, you want that bar. Um, so figuring out how will people discover your community? How will they get invited? Will you gamify that invite process? Um, uh, is a, a really exciting, interesting part of the community funnel design. Um, who are those people that you want to get in? Where do they hang out? How will they discover and be invited to the community? Um, and uh, uh, and that can start really small. You know, one of my favorite communities on on Discord is like the Starbucks barista community, and it, it's it's I it's designed and managed by Starbucks baristas, but they let other folks in. And it's just really fun because you get to see, you know, behind the scenes of what's really going on in Starbucks. You can uh, um, interact with with the members, but it started very small um, and yeah. now it's, it's grown. Um, and then secondly, like join and be welcome to the space. Wow, this is so important. Everybody I'm sure knows what it's like when you walk into a house party, a party and you know, no one really greets you. You don't know where to go. And it's, um, it's not a great feeling. So I think the importance of being welcomed by another member, by the manager of the community um, is just paramount because that helps you feel like, oh, I could, I could, fit in here and maybe they direct you to have a conversation with Sujin or maybe they say oh hey you know you should check out this space um yeah. there's just that first impression is an amazing indicator of retention if people can get to talking within the first like five minutes of being in there and, and find a valuable connection they are going to the your predictability of them being a highly retentive user is significantly greater than if they haven't had a good welcome experience um yeah and, and then continuing down so yeah introduce and begin talking to others so um getting those initial conversations going making people feel like there are other people here that are interested and there are there are so many ways to achieve this just through the architecture of your community space you know is it a slack is it a telegram is it a discord and um, is it a geneva like wherever you are deciding to build this space um i think architecting it in a way that uh okay maybe it's like location based and in, in an easy step okay so everybody who's in brooklyn williamsburg this is where you can meet each other um or whatever sort of defining point that brings people together um um, and then, yeah, getting to a point of value from the conversations like, uh, and I think a good way to measure that is um, how often are people coming back into your community space to engage with each other uh, and um, which leads to the point of one of the greatest, most magical points, I think, in this funnel is when you truly begin to form online friendships with people. You've joined a space you've started chatting with strangers on the internet. Uh, you have started to find a, a shared interest um, uh, on, on any topic or location front to a point where you're coming back enough that you're actually friends. And that is when you make a turning point, I think as a community builder, is when you've built a space that people genuinely are friends in um, and want to help each other and are protective over the space and want it to be a space they're proud of. Um, which comes to the sense of feeling uh, like responsible. They want to come back. They want to show up. They want to contribute. Um, and uh, true friendship is just the, the most sort of yeah, genuine, genuine way. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I um, just in you saying that, I just was thinking about the sort of early days of us building Startup Grind. And I mean, we knew people's kids' names. We knew everything going on in their lives, these people that were involved with us. And, and it wasn't just that we knew it or we had it in some, you know, Salesforce database or something like we genuinely cared. And, um, and you know, we were, we were genu genuinely, you know, trying to help each other. And that then sort of, you know, that, that feeling, you know, it's, it's not something you can really fake. And, um, you know, that sort of spread and, and, you know, attracted more of those kinds of people. But yeah, it's just like, it's, uh, you know, it, it's a lot of little things. Um, and 
absolutely and and like when i when i was doing my book um and i i interviewed all of the, these founders of some of the greatest online community platforms like from the 1980s through to today um stacy horn founded echo which was a a, a you know community platform um, based in the new york in new york in the east village and um she fundamentally believed that she had to have a 15 minute intro call with every single member of her community. Yeah. She had to know their kids' names. She had to know, uh, you know, what their job was so that she could then make those connections. Um, and that is just so uh, important. Um, and uh, then then outside of that, one thing that I, I really love in the online communities that I'm a part of is uh, just like a weekly email digest of what happened because there's just so much going on in everyone's world every week that just knowing oh you know Derek joined he does this or like Amber's just done this book and that I find a very useful way to stay up to date with like what other members are doing um yeah I know uh uh we've got hundreds of people here uh and I'm sure much many better questions than I can ask. So please jump over to the Q and A tab, throw your question in there. And we're going to, we're going to go to those questions here very shortly. Um, we've, we've talked a lot about community member growth. Do you have any practical sort of tangible takeaways for the audience on, on maintaining, you know, those healthy relationships with existing communities and, and sort of how do you divide your time? Uh, between sort of growth and maintaining the health uh, of of the people that are already there. Yeah, I mean it's it's such a challenge um, because it's yeah. How do you maintain high quality um, conversation and interaction, uh, but at the same time continue to grow the community? And I think that is go back to the goes back to the point earlier of. The very top of the funnel is about figuring out your invite process, who qualifies to be part of the community. And I think that dictates growth, retention, everything. Um, because once you start figuring out, like qualifying the members, uh, that is going to just naturally help you um, uh, create a space that is very engaging and sustainable um, from a growth point of view. Um, one thing I'll say just as another practical bit of a, advice maybe is you can't do all of this by yourself. The, the last part of that funnel is giving responsibilities to other community members to help you uh, like promote the community, maintain its high quality uh, interactions and, and evolve the community to meet the members needs, uh, new, new spaces, new discussion points. Um, and I think that the best way to uh, think about responsibilities and hiring a community manager is to hire somebody from the community, right? Yeah. Um, who already knows it, and, and again, it can be uh, you know that first person to help you. Um, so uh, I think that that's uh, yeah an, an important way to to think about. It. It's not all on your shoulders. Love to just to ask you some questions about Discord, and you know, definitely seeing. Uh, obviously, Discord's been you know, really prevalent in the gaming industry for a long time. Um, seeing other brands and other types of communities trying to break into it and to use it where and sort of what scenarios do you see or, or would you recommend using Discord and what scenarios would you recommend not using Discord mm -hmm. in terms of different kinds of communities? Mm -mm -mm. Well, I think uh, it's like figuring out where your communities are. Like it's, it's you can uh, research like who are the Discord's main main users um, and uh, the, the the types of folks that like using uh, the Discord product in their day to day life already. Um, mm -hmm. So I would think about choosing a space where your customers or community members already are. Um, uh, but uh, I, I think Discord is genuinely a great solution uh, for multiple different types of community building um and it doesn't need to be uh complicated in the beginning you know we, we used to say to folks uh you know you're building disneyland but you're not going to have the entire park ready on day one you're going to have the ticket booth and then a ride and then your community members will decide we want this roller coaster so it's building it up over time so it's not so intimidating but i think that um it's uh it's definitely 
pulling your early members, right? Those early users who are evangelists, where do they want to be? Where do they want to hang out? If it's too much of a high bar for them to download Discord and they don't know what it is, then maybe there's another tool. Maybe it, maybe it's a WhatsApp chat in the beginning. You know, I'm part of like four or five amazing WhatsApp communities and I love that. Um, but I'm also part of a few good Discords. So figure that out with the community um, and just know that the Discord architecture doesn't need to be incredibly complicated in the beginning. It can grow, it can start super simple, have a read-only channel, have a weekly voice, you know, meetup uh, in, in your Discord server where people get to know each other um, and then slowly introduce new things over time. Do you see like business communities on Discord or is it is it more um, the sort of... Uh, you know, like more organic or, I mean, gaming communities, yes, but even, even mm. uh, like do really formal businesses in the gaming community, are they successful there? Like Microsoft's or Sony's, those kinds of brands are, yeah. and, or, or do you think like businesses, business communities should, should probably live somewhere else? Um, well, I will say that like developer communities are massive on Discord, like the Stripe developer community is fantastic. Um, and I think there are uh, like more so like the design community, Adobe has an incredible um, professional design community. And I know that a lot of the, you know, Y Combinator businesses are building their office on Discord. So, you know, it's a team of 10, 20, um, and you, it's just a very different experience and feeling to Slack. Oh. First of all, and it's also free. Like, instead of Slack, <laughs> like, like they, yeah. Like, oh, really interesting. Yes, yeah. So we, we uh, definitely tons of uh, tons of companies are starting to think about Discord as their virtual office and the way that you can design it, the types of emojis, the voice channels you can create, the, the hangout spaces. It's just a very because it's a consumer first product versus an enterprise first product. It has a different feeling um so yeah that that's definitely um a big deal i mean obviously all of the game developers have had uh their virtual offices and um communities on discord for a long time um so but you know for sure in the last few years you've seen more mainstream businesses um bring their customer community or like specific parts of their team um, to interact on Discord. Um, I love the StockX community. Uh, that, that's that's mm -hmm. a really amazing uh, Discord server. It feels like, um, and you kind of alluded this a little bit about when you, whenever, you, whenever someone used the word utility, uh, I think of um, the sort of op opposite of, of uh, most crypto communities. Um, <laughs> but did you see, you know, seeing a lot of those, I mean, there, it felt like every crypto community, every Web3 community had, is doing something on Discord. Mm -hmm. um, and did you see a difference in those kinds of communities versus like some of these ones you referenced, like StockX or Stripe? Um, and did you see any patterns with, with them? Because it, it mm. felt like many or, or most of these um, groups, I'm not, I'm not singling out Discord, but just the, the many of the Web3 communities are just kind of like, um, you know, not, just kind of hollow, uh, frankly. Uh, and uh, it's sort of like had, you know, very passionate people, you know, kind of coming in and then quickly leaving. But I just wondered if somebody that could see all these different communities on top of Discord, like, what what did you see that was different now looking back you know, the last couple of years mm. on, on what happened in web three and in the crypto space, like were, were there sort of some tall tale signs of like, Hey, these are different than some of them, some of, you know, the stock X's and the stripes of the world, or did they look the same as those kind of communities? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, uh, Web3 and crypto, like it's just flocked to, to Discord uh, to, to, to build. And right now, if you're, if you're building in that, that space and you don't have a Discord server, it's uh, slightly suspicious, I think, for, for users. Um, but yeah, I think that uh, it's still tricky because the, the safety and the onboarding into crypto is not uh, not necessarily there yet. I think Discord's done an amazing job of reducing spam 
uh, in those servers so that it's a better experience for users. But a lot of those servers where it felt like there was no utility or belonging, people were just in and out, uh, felt more like a casino uh, than a community. Um, but I will say there are a couple like Azuki or um, Shibuya that are very, very thoughtfully designed communities. And I love a lot of the DAOs that exist on Discord as well are brilliant. And I think that the reason why they have such high levels of engagement and it is uh, thoughtfully designed is there's a sense of ownership that comes uh, that's very different from a Web2, like a StockX or an Adobe. Um, people feel, uh, you know, they have a sense of ownership. They have the token, they have the NFT, they, they want to help define what it feels like. Um, but the, there's a big difference you can tell from the communities that have thought about who is coming into this space and who isn't. Um, uh to the field um so yeah yeah i think uh sean sean had a a good comment in here and it, there's so many comments i i lost it um but this i uh, this uh the the some of the issues is a lot of these people came in with this like pump pump it up mm. and, and then and it's it's almost like the opposite of um of what communities are supposed to be about so right um to your point of like building it up and building deep relationships, building belonging. And a lot of these things were just not really designed in that way at all. And, and I think like the economy, like the market conditions right now of this uh, environment for crypto is going to flush out a lot of those bad experiences for people and the people that are continuing to build today, like any, you know, web three community managers that are here, I think realize like you, that those spaces are not sustainable and it's not good business, it's not good experiences for anybody. Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I, I'm optimistic that the, the next wave of, you know, crypto communities that are built will be done. So with, with games, like with very, you know, a higher quality bar for community architecture. So there are so many great questions in the Q&A. We're going to go to them. Please put any more that you have. Uh, I just the last thing I just wanted to cover was uh, your book, uh, The Rise of Virtual Communities. Uh, yes. Can you, uh, give us the, the, the URL for book is up at the top of the chat. Uh, great. Communities books, book .com. Um, can you just give us a sneak peek? Like what, what is in the, I assume some of these things that we talked about are in the book, but anything else uh, yeah. in the book that you can share and how can we get it and all those fun things? Yeah. So um, the, the website is real ode to Y2K internet culture, like a more wholesome time <laughs> being online. Uh, so please, please enjoy. Um, yeah, you can pre-order, sign up uh, on the website. Um, and the, the book is 15, it's a series of interviews with 15 founders. Uh, so the lessons from, you know, uh, sort of a, a, a have a hotel, a second life, a uh, palace chat, the first avatar based chat room, uh, all the way through to, you know, an interview with Jason, the CEO of Discord, um, Alexis from Reddit, Kevin, who started Dig and has now started Proof. Um, and, uh, you know, FWB, there's so many incredible bits of community knowledge, you know, s straight from the founder's mouth in this book. Um, so I wanted to sort of collate uh, those experiences and just provide a sort of fascinating map of how the community space has evolved from those very early platforms in the, the 80s, Lucasfilms, Habitat, um, through to, you know, Web3 communities today. What has stayed the same? How has like behavior evolved with technology? Um, and what are the challenges that people still face? You know, moderation is still, still a big issue and it's still, it was then too. Um, and what are the tools that we've got now to help uh, build higher quality spaces? So um, uh, uh, yeah, so um, the, the, the book will be available uh, in May, um, but yeah, pre-orders are, are open now. And uh, we'll be interviewing different community leaders within the space every month on the blog. Um, so the head of community from Geneva uh, is this weekend, Mindy Day, who some of you folks may know from Discord, yeah. who's a fantastic community leader, uh, shares some of her insights on the blog next month too. So um, very anybody who's on the call today, um, please feel free to submit 
um, would be delighted to, to speak with you and, and share your thoughts on the blog too. Awesome. Yeah, really exciting. Yeah, the website's amazing and uh, very, uh, it's great marketing. Uh, <laughs> uh, and also, does I mean, the, some of those people are some of the, I mean, the, the community leaders that I certainly have looked up to and they built some of the best communities uh, in the world. So sounds like, sounds like a great, a, a really great book. Um, well, great. Let's, let's jump over to the Q and a, um, and, and I'm going to pass it over to Sujin who's curating some of these, but there's so many great questions. Let's just start powering through them. Great. And hopefully Derek, you can jump in too with your thoughts on, on these answers. I'd, I'd, lo I'd personally love to know what you think too. <laughs> yes, everyone, if you are, this is the time to hear from you. So please submit your questions. I'm going to be going in the order of um, what's been upvoted. And so I'll start with the first one um, from Kanal. And his question is, as a community manager, there are a lot of times where there's no direct ROI that can be attributed to community efforts and brand campaigns. What are the key metrics you track at each stage of the funnel or for different initiatives? And what timelines uh, you follow for the same? Because of course it can't be as short as a performance camp campaign. Mm, what a great question. Yes. I'm sure we're all challenged by every day. Um, I think it's brilliant to measure those different phases of the quadrant. So, okay, how, how many of your customers or users actually joined the community last month? Um, and, you know, what efforts are working there to make more people, uh, you know, active community members? Um, and uh, that, that in itself would be a great thing to measure. Why do you want to do that? Why should your customers be part of a community. Well, the idea is if people have a sense of belonging and utility in a community, they're more likely to buy your product more frequently and spend more money with you. Um, so I think th those two things are what uh, we saw with brands on Discord. And also what I saw with Zyper is that once you have that uh, connection, you're more likely to be a higher value repeat customer that's more loyal. Um, uh, and we, we, we would measure that with customers through, uh, you know, um, tracking pixels, like seeing cross mapping, who was in the community that bought, who redeemed a certain code, et cetera. Um, so that, that's just some baseline measuring the quadrant and then, um, uh, being able to track, uh, like loyalty, uh, would be my ROI suggestions. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, Jasmine is asking, do you have any favorite tools you've used to build com community evangelists more formally? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I, I know is the answer. It's always been a very manual process of, um, you know, myself, a couple of community managers, um, you know, getting to know customers and users, talking to them, knowing who they are, documenting all of that probably in an Excel mm -hmm. spreadsheet or a Notion and um, uh, having a content plan around, uh, you know, how we're going to engage with those evangelists and, and what they're up to. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, but there are, uh, you know, tons of new community dashboards that are coming out that are helping folks like better enrich their data. There's, there's a company called Leveler, there's another one called Orbit that's helping uh, folks better manage and segment communities um so um but yeah but but i think in, in the very beginning just starting with a small enough uh bunch of folks who are your evangelists it's fine to for it to be manual um before you scale up to like a crm system mm -hmm. yeah it requires that human touch right yeah definitely um hannah's asking can you have true community-led growth without a specific channel run by the company so for example slack or a discord or circle uh, for users to communicate so can you can you is it achievable is it doable i love this and I, I mean there are so many thousands of communities out there that are actually run by the fans I mean, Netflix is a good example. Like before Netflix um, came on to Discord with their their bot, um, they had a, just a fan run community. And they, instead of starting their own company owned 
Discord server, they were given a role within the fan owned community and they were able to use that role to go in and host like monthly giveaways, Q and A with cast members. Um, so I think if a fan owned community, uh, if, if you've got the fans is fantastic. Um, uh, and there, there might be ways that you can artificially like sort of create that by again speaking to your users speaking to your customers does somebody want to start the community like you know over to you um we can give you some resources but we'd love you to independently run it could be another way um but i do think there's a there's a level of authenticity that comes with band communities um that uh is different it's just interesting as well in creator communities um uh, when I've spoken to users and creator communities, sometimes there's 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 a lack of engagement, and mm. that can mm. come from a sense of intimidation. That oh gosh, the creators reading our messages, and um, so it's yeah. just something good to think about. Definitely. Um, we have a question here: How many of your users or customers should be ambassadors, or is there like a healthy ratio? for the quadrant, what would you say, you know, how many or what percentage would you say should be ambassadors? Or is there not a met like a, not a percentage you would assign it? Well, I think we have to be, there's some element of wariness I have around um, ambassadors because consumers know that they're being incentivized um, to promote the product or the community. So I think just bearing that in mind um, and choosing thoughtfully like who your ambassadors are knowing that your customers are not dumb and they they know that they're being paid so i would be very thoughtful around why do these ambassadors help us um you know help the community and how do they help us reach new communities mm. um what sort of con what, what can they provide the community outside of just promoting it um mm -hmm. i think that builds a lot of goodwill um and um i would say that uh not not all of your customers should be incentivized ambassadors um definitely not but um uh should they all be you know evangelists ideally yes you know yeah. they, they you want as many customers as possible to love your product so much that they they want to talk to others about it um, and I mean, I think if you can get uh, like, you know, big structure goal here, but like if, if you can get to, you know, 30, 40 percent of your customers, like actively being in your community, being your evangelist and, you know, set a number that feels good for you. But I think that's a great to the ROI question earlier. Mm -hmm. like that, that's a great point because that, that's just going to fuel your business further. There's another concept I talk about in the article, which is about. Um, just the Venn diagram of like business needs and member needs and community living in the intersection of business needs and member needs. Mm -hmm. um, and like community really succeeds when you're serving both sides equally. So like why, what is, how is the business gaining over time and, and how is the community gaining? Right, definitely. Uh, we have, so I'm assuming in our audience, there's a mix of uh, you know, different community professionals and the, the types of communities and the sizes of the communities that they're managing um, and overseeing. But one, Susie is asking, what growth advice do you have for platforms that are just starting up? So less than a thousand users to find and retain new members. So kind of a big picture question there. Mm, yeah, this is a great question. Well, I mean, amazing. You've got your a thousand, uh, you know, a thousand first users, so let's go back to the quadrant again. Like how many of those, like, can we get to be evangelists? Like who, who out of that a thousand of the first community members? Um, once you know those people that you can ask them, how do you think we should find new members? Like, where should we go? Like, who do you think would find real value from this? Because they will then feel like you're listening to them and incentivized to actually go and help you find those people too. I've seen this in a few communities um, and it really does work. Like I, I, I'm incentivized to go and help find community members for this, you know, British entrepreneur community I'm a part of. And I want to, you know, message people all the time about it. So I think, again, knowing your users and asking them to help you is the foundation of community. So figuring that out um, will hopefully help you know 
who are the people that they want to interact with and where do you where do they think we can find them um outside of that um i would probably say that uh it's like look, look you know you looking at what other spaces exist out there um i uh and what content would attract people i mean even for me deciding to put these ideas together and publishing it um that was a very top of funnel exercise for me of finding you know new new people to interact with so i would maybe recommend that as well it's like creating content um, that you know will attract those new members um, that can be discovered on YouTube, TikTok, um, other platforms. Yeah, it's extremely helpful to have a visual and a graphic. And to everyone, I just shared her article in the chat. A few people were asking. So I think it's applicable to anyone and everyone. So please take a look there. Um, Thank you. Sarah, did you have anything that you were going to share? No, it was great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, just on that point about, hey, I have a thousand people. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's incredible. And you, you know, 80, it's a the sort of 80 20 rule, like 80% of the, the work is usually gets done by 20% of the people. So, you know, if you're cultivating a really small group of passionate people who are getting a lot of benefit out of what your community offers or what your product offers, um, that can be enough and that kind of gets the fire started and hopefully, you know, you're adding a few people here or there. Also, like when you're dealing with volunteers, I think I used in the early days of building a community, I used to think, oh, when people would leave, it'd just be like, oh, it felt so personal. Like, oh, they're leaving. Well, how can they leave? Like, what did we do wrong? And just like when you're dealing with volunteers, like they're just naturally going to come in and cycle through. So you kind of need to just, it's not, it's not, it's often not about you. It's often about them and what's happening in their lives. And so, you know, just continuing to keep the sort of stable of a small group of people who are super engaged and passionate and getting benefit and, and being successful with it. And, you know, and, and, and that, that can just grow as, an, as, as it needs to grow over time. Mm. Now let's go on the other side of the spectrum in terms of the size of the community. So Ashley is asking, any tips for pages with millions of followers where one-on-one -on -one tactics aren't as feasible? Interesting. Uh, pages with millions of followers. Well, I mean, I mean, to Derek's point, I, I maybe this is just going to sound very repetitive, but I, I would still go and look at the people who are on those pages that are interacting the most on the page. So who are the people that are interacting the most on the page? Who are the ones that are starting discussion? Who are the ones that are sharing things, liking things? Because th those people are um, engaging. Um, and and it, maybe it's not one-to-one. -one. Maybe it's then just creating a list of those people and doing a one-to-many saying, hey, you know, we notice that you're, you're one of our top fans. And actually, we'd love to invite you to be part of this, you know, new community we're building. Um, and I probably will have, that would probably have a pretty high conversion rate because you already know that they are qualified to, to be part of it. Um, um, yeah, so I, I think I'd, I'd start, I'd start there again. It's just like knowing your user and, and customer, um, and then one to many, um, if, if the one to one is a little too much at that, at that scale. Definitely. So we talked about the quadrant we talked about the funnel. So one is asking, um, we have Mary Blessing asking, what strategies do you have to grow a community to the 3,000 and 5,000? What is the timeline that you'd ideally set to achieve this realistically? So do you have a timeline, Amber? Do you have mm -hmm. certain expectations in terms of what this growth, growth should look like for each community? Yeah, well, I, I think it also depends on like what what are the, the what are the expectations from other stakeholders in terms of how quickly you need to grow. Uh, like, does your does your does your business does your you know your investors do, do they do they have expectations of this uh, being a north star um, and aligning with those stakeholders and what the expectations is would be like how I would approach it. Um, uh, but then, then outside of that, I would say, you know, the, the friction between wanting to grow really, really quickly, but also having high quality members um, is 
uh, you know, a challenge. And personally, I think slow and steady wins the race. You know, you want to build a sustainable community of people who are not just going to show up and leave, um, but they are actually, you know, they, they're qualified. Uh, I joined this community recently that has about 200 people in, and I had to do two different interviews to get into the community. But now, my God, am I obsessed with being in this community? So, I mean, it's just basic human behavior. So I, I, I would think about setting goals that meet what your stakeholder expectations are and that you also feel comfortable with in terms of ensuring that it is a healthy, sustainable community. Um, because to me, it's more important to have a community with fantastic engagement and very high retention of members um, that's growing, you know, more slowly over time than to have a community that suddenly has, you know, 10,000 people in and it's chaos and you don't know who anyone is. And that isn't really a community. It's just a group of people shouting at each other. <laughs> Awesome. Well, we'd love to shift really quickly to your new book, The Rise of Virtual Communities. And perhaps you discussed this there, but one is asking, um, what about in-person engagements? How do you balance that with digital experience, digital communities? Do you talk about that or what are your thoughts? Yeah, on yeah it's, a, it's a great question. And I actually ask almost everyone in the book, um, how do they think about uh, trust in virtual spaces? How do they think about the balance between uh, like bringing people together in real life? Um, and actually, um, Katrina, the co-founder of Flickr, had some really uh, strong views on this that uh, actually it is really important to bring people together. Um, and that will likely naturally happen anyway within the you know, in the Flickr photo community, people were, were creating organic meetups themselves all across the world. Um, but what does real life bring you? Uh, you know, the chance to see somebody face to face to make that human connection. Um, and I think it comes down to like, what, what does the community want? You can experiment. Um, and if that doesn't get a lot of uptake, then maybe that's not what your specific community needs. Um, Deviant Art, uh, which other folks may remember, um, he, the founder is also featured in the book and he was also a firm believer um, in the importance of meeting his community members all over the world. And they spent a year going on a Deviant Art global tour um, to, you know, however many, 20 different countries um, and, and meeting up with people and creating those connections for people. Um, so, um, it, you know, I think it is important. A lot of community leaders think it is important. Um, but I, at the end of the day, it comes down to like, what is best going to serve your specific community? Um, and maybe it is more, uh, it's not so frequent, it's different styles. Um, but yeah, definitely. In the same line, I guess this question kind of marries the two cut the, you know, the, the topic of uh, what we discussed today, and then uh, the rise of virtual communities. But Genesee is asking, how do you reconcile the apparent dichotomy of connecting personally with the community and the emotional part, and also determining the key KPI factors and how those marry well, or even how they might prove time is best spent on other items? So um, she's saying, please tell me that they do work together, that connection and community does affect the bottom line. So how, what are your thoughts on that? Um, and can you reconcile that dichotomy? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's tough. It's like, you ought to be being able to switch gears and to sort of friend, uh, into, you know, like you're also doing this for a business ROI. like, again, it's that like the Venn diagram of the community needs and the business needs like that success is, is in the middle. So, um, it does. And, and I, I think we will appreciate that that is challenging to make the switch of you've really built a connection with, your community members and now, hey, you actually need to ask them to give you some insights in a survey. Um, but, you know, I think that's fine. I think I think that everyone should acknowledge that they're in this community that is, you know, the resources are being put to work from a business point of view to invest in this space and um, part of, uh, you know, being here. And that's about setting expectations in the beginning, I think. As long as you set the expectations with the community members of like what is this space no one will be disappointed 
um, because yeah, it's going to be an amazing place for belonging and they're going to get X value from it. But what, what, what do you, what are you expecting from it? Um, I think that's just healthy relationship building. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, confident that it can happen when the expectations are set. Awesome. Uh, we have a few more minutes here and I find this one interesting. Um, so Dana is asking specifically about Discord, but perhaps we can talk about any platform, but how do you feel about Discord for people that aren't super techie? They're between 40 to 60 years old and they already have a hard time, a hard enough time keeping up with the Slack community. So um, what are your thoughts on kind of the, the wave of, or I guess the learning curve? Well, I will just say that my dad is like a power Discord user and he's like 60 something. So I think that, and that there are so many, um, uh, you know, folks who are like above 50 who are actually like growing uh, on, on Discord and joining Discord every day. But yes, there is some sort of tech relation or gaming relation generally. Um, they orbit the, the interests of, of the platform. Um, and so I would say though that it's about meeting your customers where they are, right? Like maybe it's not Discord, maybe it's just a WhatsApp group. Maybe it is a, uh, you know, an email. There's a, you know, maybe it's a weekly email that has a, a Zoom session every week too. You know, there are so many different ways that you can set it up depending on what your users are into. If, if email and a weekly Zoom call is the best thing, then cool. If it's a, you know, if it if it's Slack or if it's a, a text group um, or if it's an IRL meetup, um, I think that uh, it's just, yeah, experimenting with what the right home is. And actually um, this is so important. And Lance, who's one of the co-founders of Club Penguin, which some folks may remember, he speaks a lot about this in the book about the importance of designing the third place and the space is like the most important thing. Um, and, you know, in Club Penguin, that town square, like that was so important. Those spaces were really important. Um, and, uh, you know, designing that first uh, is a good way to approach it. Nice. One last question, kind of in the same line of that, uh, whether it's Discord or another community uh, communication platform, what are your thoughts on letting a Discord server be run by community members that have taken the initiative to start and manage um, manage it? And is this something that the brand itself should own? So I guess it's how much power, how much oversight should the the company um, have in terms of the platform? Yeah, it's oh gosh, I think it really comes down to the company. Um, uh, you know, part of the challenges of, of having a, having a brand is, you know, you want to ma maintain um, the, the brand aspiration or just the brand identity and you don't want folks to, to you know, ruin, ruin, you know, potentially what you what you've built or one bad apple to anyway. Um, I, I've seen some incredible um, fan servers run um, they're not, you know, officially affiliated with the company. Um, but the, the company may have a role and they, they've built a relationship with the community um, mods to be able to, to trust them. Uh, I think if you have made that connection, you trust those folks, then it's, it's a, it's a, can be a really successful uh, way to run community. Um, so uh, I think it's just so personal. You've got to trust the mods and, and know that, um, that, that they will uh, keep your brand safe. Um, and there are, uh, you know, there's risk involved with that, but there's also enormous upside, uh, from an authenticity point of view. Amazing. Well, Amber, that hour just flew by. Thank you so much to you, Amber, for joining us today. Thank you to Derek for leading the conversation. And before we go, um, Amber, you touched upon, upon this, but getting, um, hearing from the community. And so just really want to shout, give a shout out, um, just the CMX team, we've put together a survey, would love for everyone to participate. We'd love to hear your voice and see, you know, what trends are we expecting? What is your experience in the community currently? And so we would love to hear from you. I posted the link in the chat there. 
Um, but stay tuned for our next master class every month. And thank you once again for tuning in. I hope everyone has a great yeah, rest of the day. Nice to see you, thank everyone. You, have a great week. Thanks, Eugene. Bye, everyone. Take care.